Welcome to the Emerging Civil War Virtual Symposium. I'm Chris Mikowski, Editor-in-Chief. Thank you so much for joining us online for this year's event. Uh, I want to give one final shout out to our technical director, Chris White, for his help behind the camera today. Uh, ECW's co-founder, making sure that today is happening for us virtually. Thank you, Chris. Also, a thank you to uh, our symposium co-coordinators, Kevin Pollack and Dan Welch, whose hard work has made today's event possible. And also, thank you to our friends at C-SPAN for sharing Americans, his, American history, uh, a very important uh, task in these days. Our final speaker for today is Paige Gibbons-Backus. We've been talking a lot today about the war in the East, but we can't forget about the aftermath of battle as well. And uh, one of the most compelling portions about Civil War history and the Civil War story. Uh, Paige is a public historian with Prince William County, Virginia. She's also the social media manager for Emerging Civil War. And she's here today to talk about the carnage in the medical field of the Civil War. Thank you so much, Chris, for having me. And thank you all for uh, listening in and watching these videos and joining us for the Virtual Emerging Civil War Symposium for some history at home. And so today, what I'm going to be talking to you about is I'm going to be talking about the life, uh, the fight for life and death in uh, the aftermath of these battles over the American Civil War. And we've heard a lot of talks today about different battles. We learned about uh, prison camps. We've learned about raids. And the aftermath of the battle uh, and in the years and days and months following was, in a sense, a whole other war in itself. Uh, it was a fight for life and death. It was a war against battle wounds and a war against disease. And one historian who wrote a book called Learning with the Wounded uh, wrote that doctors were actually the unsung heroes of the Civil War, and that the Civil War was overwhelming in its scope, and the physicians that were forced to practice tirelessly in the general hospitals and temporary field hospitals uh, were treating the dying and wounded after these horrific battles. And so what ended up being four years of war cost over 700,000 casualties. And so over the course of our discussion today, uh, we are going to be discussing some of the challenges that this created uh, and some of the different fights that had to take place in this war of life and death and what ultimately resulted uh, and what uh, good came out of this fight for life and death that a lot of us today take for granted in the medical field. And so for the purpose of our conversation today, uh, I could be talking to you all all day about anything and everything with Civil War medicine. Uh, but for the purpose of our conversation today and our 45 minutes that I have allotted, uh, I've pulled examples mainly focusing on the war in the East, which was the theme of the Emerging Civil War Virtual Symposium today. But before we can even start, talking about some of the different challenges that were faced in the medical field over the course of the Civil War, we need to talk a little bit about where the medical field was at the beginning of the Civil War. And so at the time of the Civil War in the 1850s and 1860s, there has been significant medical advancement uh, since the 18th century. Uh, we've far gone beyond the four humors, which you'll see pictured here, uh, which are essentially uh, blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm, uh, meaning if one of those were out of balance, you were sick, and they had to put those in back in balance. Uh, little known fact, it's actually, one, this is one of the reasons uh, George Washington died when he had pneumonia, because they took too much blood to try and rebalance those humors. And so by the time the Civil War, this was coming out of fashion. Uh, you had the study of anatomy that was taking place with the use of cadavers, both legally and illegally, with things as such as body snatching that started coming around in the 1830s. But you have different studies of the medical field, like bacteriology, epi uh, 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 excuse me, epidermology, that are not taking place at this point in time. And that would all come into place by the time that the Civil War began in 1861. However, 
by the time of the 1850s and 1860s, you do have medical schools that have been around since the 1700s. Some of the better known schools were in Paris, such as you see pictured here with the Paris Clinical School. Uh, you see the medical school in Edinburgh, Scotland. And so Europe was much more advanced at this point in time than the United States. However, you do start having medical schools in major cities like Boston, New York, Philadelphia that are starting to take, uh, that are starting to take hold and students are starting to attend. However, for a lot of these schools, there is not very much clinicals like we are used to today with the medical schools that students attend. It's more learning from books and it's more observations from these cadavers. But by this point in time, in the 1850s and 1860s, the United States was trying to catch up to Europe by creating medical associations, establishing the American Medical Association, uh, and trying to reform the medical field through journals, medical societies, as well as experiments and investigations. But by the time that the Civil War began, the medical departments, both for the Northern Army and the Confederate Army, thought they were well prepared for what they were going to experience. However, at the very first major battle of the Civil War on July 21st, 1861, at the Battle of First Manassas, would really illuminate just the, how many challenges the medical field is going to experience over the course of the Civil War. And at the Battle of First Manassas, you had 36,000 troops that were engaged in a battle that lasted about 24 hours. And by the end of that 24 hours, you had over 3,500 soldiers who were wounded or missing. And at the very beginning of the Battle of First Manassas, these challenges immediately started to reveal themselves to the medical departments. Now, in the medical field, you had two surgeons to each regiment. So that meant you had a surgeon and an assistant surgeon for about 1,000 men. For the Union armies, there were no hospitals established there on the battlefield because they had marched that morning from Centerville. And for the Confederate Army, it was four miles to the south in the Manassas Junction. There were no hospitals set up close to the front lines. Additionally, at this point in time, there was no centralized ambulance corps. The regiments had their own ambulances, and there would, no, or there would not be an ambulance corps that's federalized until August of 1862. This meant that the ambulances were regimental. This meant that there were cases, in fact, that some soldiers were actually picked up with priority over others based on what their regiments wore. It also meant that there was very poor organization, which resulted in slower action, which resulted in more deaths. And just to kind of give you an idea of some of the scenes that were found at First Manassas, one soldier, John Opie from the 5th Virginia Infantry, described the scene at one field hospital at Portici uh, in the hours after the battle. And he writes, there were piles of legs, feet, hands, arms, all thrown together and at a distance resembled piles of a corn at a corn shucking. Many of the feet still retained a boot or shoe. Wounded men were lying on tables, and surgeons, some of who at the time were very unskillful, were carving away, like farmers at butchering season, while the poor devils under the knife yelled with pain. Many limbs were lost that should have been saved, and many lives were lost trying to save the limbs that should have been amputated. There was another group of Confederate soldiers that came across a few Union soldiers in the stone house made famous by the Battle of Manassas. And one of them remarked that in that building, there were 32 soldiers, many of them that were dreadfully, dreadfully mangled by cannon shot. There was but one single surgeon, and he was young and apparently inefficient. Men lay on the floor with their clotted wounds still undressed. Some had died and not yet been removed. And so for a lot of these surgeons and a lot of the medical personnel that was operating at the Battle of First Manassas, this was the first time of them seeing warfare. And this was the first time that many of them had actually any practical experience. And so there were mistakes that cost soldiers' lives. There were mistakes that also saved soldiers' lives. But at the Battle of First Manassas, it was not a life yet, or it was not a fight yet for life or death. At this point, the lines were still divided between North and South. And this would create issues in the surgeon, for the surgical field because when hospitals were captured, this meant that you had surgeons that were taken away from their wounded patients. 
one including at this hospital here, Sudley Church. Now, when the Union Army began their route to head back to Centerville, decisions had to be made by those Union surgeons. Do they stay with their soldiers and risk imprisonment down in Richmond, or do they leave their patients behind? One surgeon from the 11th Massachusetts left a soldier on the operating table and ran. Others decided to stay, and they were taken away and sent to Richmond for the prisoner of war camps, leaving Confederate troops in need and treatment. But for a lot of these Union surgeons who were overwhelmed with their own wounded, that meant a lot of these Confederate soldiers did not receive the treatment that they needed, costing many lives. And as a result of this, not a year later, in June, May and June of 1862, this gentleman here, Dr. Hunter McGuire, and several other Union surgeons who were captured enter into an agreement in May of 1862, stating that we surgeons and assistant surgeons of the United States Army, who are now prisoners of war in this place, do give our parole of honor on being unconditionally released to report in person, singly or collectively, to the Secretary of War in Washington City as such, and that we will use our best efforts in the same number of medical officers of the Confederate States Army, now prisoners, or may hereafter be taken and released on the same terms. And this effectively, since May of 1862, with Edwin Stanton creating Order Number 60, essentially made medical personnel neutral over the course of the rest of the war. And at this point, it did turn into a fight of life or death where medical personnel, both for the Union and Confederate soldiers, were trying to try and save as many lives as possible. But at this point, you have several other challenges that illuminate themselves over the course of the Civil War. And one of the biggest ones is the increase in casualties. Now remember, for the Battle of First Manassas, you have about 3,500 casualties in one single day. For example, Antietam in September of 1862, the number of wounded in the Battle of Antietam in one single day would reach over 17,000. For Fredericksburg, it would reach over 13,000. For Gettysburg, it would create over 33,000 wounded soldiers. And this creates several issues in terms of food supply, medical supply, staffing, that now the medical department for both the North and the South are overwhelmed to try and save as many lives as possible. And one example in the Battle of Antietam, a New York Tribune reporter making his way to the battlefield on September 18th remarked what he saw. He said, the wounded are coming in by the thousands around and in a large barn. I counted more than 1,200 wounded. Along the same road and within the distance of two miles are more than three hospitals, each having from 600 to 700 in them, and long trains of ambulances standing in the road waiting to discharge their bloody loads. Surgeons with hands, arms, and garments covered with blood and busy amputating limbs, extracting balls, and bandaging wounds of every nature in every part of the body. In addition to this, after the Battle of Gettysburg, the entire town was turned into a hospital. And one reporter from the public Philadelphia ledger on July 15, 1863, remarked that this town and the vicinity around it with the space of a county surrounding it about eight or 10 miles is literally one vast and overcrowded hospital. In the town itself, Every available space has been freely given up by the citizens to the sufferers, and yet on this, the ninth day after the battle, several thousand are lying with arms and legs, amputated, and every other kind of conceivable wound in tents and in open fields, in woods, in stables, barns, and some of them even on the bare ground without any cover or any shelter. And this helps lead us to another challenge that was experienced in the medical field over the course of the war that had a huge impact on this fight for life and death. And that was the weather. The weather is one of the most impactful things on the memories of these soldiers and civilians that, took, uh, that were here over the course of the Civil War. And it's actually one of the most recorded events in letters and in primary documents. The weather impacted military tactics. For example, Jackson's flame, famous flanking march at the Battle of Chancellorsville would not have been made possible without the day's rains that would block the dust of the moving armies. In addition to this, we learn about 
uh, General Ambrose Burnside's Mud March in January of 1863, forcing troops to march through some of the worst weather and the muddiest roads that anyone has ever experienced. It also had a significant impact on the treatment of the wounded. Men who were exposed to the elements, especially in the field hospitals, were much more susceptible to disease and to illnesses uh, and <clears throat> conditions that impacted uh, the way that they were able to heal their wounds. And so, for example, after the Battle of Gettysburg, there was a severe thunderstorm that raged through the area, causing flooding in the fields and in the root cellars, some of which filled with water. During a violent thunder gust, for example, accompanied with a heavy wind and heavy rain, on Saturday, July 5th, after the battle, some would have drowned had not the extraordinary efforts been put forth to prevent it. In addition to this, for example, in Fredericksburg in December of 1862, the average temperature was a recorded low of the 20s and a high of the 40s or 50s. And in the days before the Battle of Fredericksburg, one Delaware soldier remarked, rain, hail, snow, and all day and far into the night. And two days later, he remarked that on December 6th and 7th, it had to be one of the coldest that I had experienced since joining the army. There were men who were frozen to death on the picket. The field hospitals fared much of the same way after the Battle of First Manassas, with snow and with rain flooding into the hospitals, getting the straw wet for these soldiers who are laying down on the ground, offering little protection and little comfort. But for many of these soldiers, those who are in the prisoner of war camps had it the worst. Many of these men were forced to live outside in shebangs or scrap shelters to shield themselves from the rain and from the heat, as well as to have little protection for their skin, for clothing, as well as little food to sustain themselves. This image here that you'll see is one of the notorious prisons in the South, the prison at Andersonville, Georgia. But from our discussion earlier today, I did pull some examples from Elmira. Now, Elmira had about 5,100 soldiers camped outdoors, where about 3,800 were housed in only 30 barracks. And so with the onset of winter, there were orders made for the barracks to be built, for many of these men were in tents without floors or with blankets. And so one soldier who was from the state of Texas, who was in Elmira in the winter, remarked that if there was ever a hell on earth, Elmira prison was that hell. But it was not a hot one. Another soldier remarked, with the weather 10, 15 degrees below zero, 100 men were trying to keep warm by one stove. Each morning, men crawled out of their bunks and would get into fights frequently for a place by the fire. God helped the sick and the weak as they were literally left out in the cold. And by December, mostly everyone was in these overcrowded uh, barracks, but with a summer drought, high temperatures, uh, and with many of these armies traveling, especially throughout the South, this led another problem, food shortages. An observer from the Christian Commission in Gettysburg remembered after the Battle of Gettysburg at a field hospital along Rock Creek, and she reflected on the typical state of the hospitals in town. And she writes, the men were in a terrible condition. They lay upon the damp ground, many of them with nothing under them. In the hospitals, there was usually in a large number of amputations. The amputa amputated stumps lined directly on the ground, except when now and then, elevated a little upon a handful of straw or a bunch of old, old rags. Many of these men, perhaps most of them, were in want of clothing. Suitable food was not to be had. The surgeons were overworked. There was an insufficient number of attendants. Nearby were nearly quite a thousand rebels, most of them severely wounded, shrieking and crying for assistance continually. Destitute of clothing, many nearly of them were naked and covered with filth, without tents, lying in the mud, cursing, praying, begging for their attendants or visitors to put an end for their suffering. Another identified soldier from the 47th, 4th, 4th, uh, 47th North Carolina, excuse me, remembered that he was at College Hospital at Gettysburg in the years after the war ended. And he writes that as a correspondence uh, as a consequence of a small number of surgeons left with us, our men suffered much. Thus, for the first two weeks, there were no nurses, no medicines, no kinds of food for men in our condition. Our supply being only two or three hard crackers a day with a small piece of fat pork. 
and now and then a cup of poor coffee. And for the men who were reduced to mere skeletons from severe wounds and loss of blood, the floor was a hard bed with only a blanket on it. And each day we became weaker and thinner until a certain point was reached. Then if our wounds were curable, nature began to revive the wasted frame. If they were not, there was a little struggle, a low moan, and the poor emaciated skeleton of what was once a man was wrapped in a blanket and born from our sight forever. And so not only would you find this struggle with the weather in these field hospitals after these battles all throughout the war, you would find them in the camps as well. The 5th Alabama that was, cock, uh, that was uh, camped at Cockpit Point in the winter of 1861, all throughout the winter, remarked, we being from Alabama, where the winters are not so severe, considered this winter of 1861-1862 to be one of the coldest of our lives, and at this high point of the Potomac, the coldest in America. So it seemed to us we'd never uh, got enough food, and we came near freezing and starving to death that winter. It is this first time in our lives that rations became uh, a part of our regular wartime life. And so having this lack of food, having this exposure to the elements, created one of the most dangerous challenges that the medical personnel were forced to face over the Civil War, and that was disease. Over the course of the Civil War, two-thirds of soldiers of that 700,000 died of disease rather than from their battle wounds. And there were several issues that caused this, even from the war's beginning, even when you had soldiers starting to enlist. Many of these soldiers were coming from all walks of life, coming from cities, coming from farms, coming from north and south, coming from the countryside. And so they were all exposed to different kinds of diseases and had different kinds of immunities. Well, when you put hundreds of soldiers together in camps, all of a sudden you have all of these soldiers grouped together living in close quarters with poor sanitation, and so diseases started spreading rampantly. And some of the most common diseases that would have been found over the course of the Civil War were diseases such as dysentery, diseases such as malaria and yellow fever caused by mosquitoes. You have measles that spread through all of these hospitals, as well as typhoid fever. But there were some things that surgeons could do to try and help curb the spread of these diseases, one of which for malaria and for yellow fever was to actually provide quinine which was one of the few effective medicines that was used over the course of the Civil War, was actually given into the soldiers' rations, where they would actually drink it with either a little bit of water, though it tastes terrible, and so they would actually prefer to drink it with a little bit of rum or a little bit of alcohol. But this was one of the few medicines that was actually provided for these soldiers to try and help curve some of these diseases. For measles and for typhoid fever, which came from being in close quarters as well as drinking, having poor drinking water, there was really no cure. And so for a lot of these diseases, like typhoid fever, who's actually one of the more dangerous diseases that were found over the course of the Civil War. Approximately 36% 30, of soldiers became sick with typhoid fever over the course of the Civil War. If they survived, they would have immunity. However, it caused about a quarter of the deaths of these diseases that were found over the course of the Civil War. And so in these hospitals, fighting with these diseases and fighting against these infections such as gangrene and diseases such as scurvy created these different challenges, but it also created successes as well. Now, before even getting into talking about some of the successes that were found over the course of the Civil War that a lot of us take for granted today, uh, we need to discuss a little bit the difference between the medical corps in the North and the South. And so the medical department in the North was a little bit more equipped. They had more staffing as well as better supplies in terms of medicine and food. And so there's a little bit more freedom in the general hospitals uh, there and throughout the North and in Washington, D.C. to be able to treat these soldiers. Throughout the South, however, the medical department was shaped by its lack of resources and the shortages in terms of food, medicine, beds, blanket, and staffing. And so as a result of that, 
the medical department for the Confederacy was solely focused on trying to save as many lives as possible with as few resources as they had available. And so because of this, a lot of the medical advancements that we take for granted today, we learn a lot of that from the Union Medical Department. And one of the biggest successes that came out of the course of the Civil War was this volume of books here, known as the Medical and Surgical History of the War of the Rebellion. And so the Surgical and Medical History of the War of the Rebellion became out of two circulars. Circular number two passed in May of 1862, and circular number five passed in June of 1862 by the Union Medical Department and Dr. William Alexander Hammond. Now these circulars, or orders in a sense, uh, were uh, passed out throughout the medical personnel throughout the North, directing medical personnel to collect specimens and illustrate the injury and diseases that produced death or disability during the war, and thus affording the materials for the precise method of study or problems regarding the diminution of morality and alleviation of suffering in armies. And so all of these were passed by Dr. William Alexander Hammond, who is a military physician and Surgeon General of the United States from 1862 to 1864. And not only did this circular establish the necessity to collect these specimens and collect these cases, it also created the Army Medical Museum as a place to store all of these specimens and store all of this information. And so, in directing all of these collections, anything that was considered of value to a surgeon uh, was sent to the Army Medical Museum, including specimens, projectiles, reports, images, on a scale that had never before been seen on, in American history and in the American medical field. And as these circulars spread, more surgeons wanted to get involved. More medical personnel wanted to get involved because not only did it create the opportunity for them to advance, it created the opportunity for surgeons to learn. Uh, for example, Dr. Jacob DaCosta, a civilian doctor who was treating ill patients in Philadelphia, was able to submit his studies using new techniques to diagnose illnesses. Additionally, Dr. Samuel Gross, chair of the surgery at the Jefferson Medical College, was able to use the circular to study the effects of camp diseases on surgery. And just a few, and so these are just a few examples of what you would find in the medical and surgical history of the War of the Rebellion. Now I do warn you, it's not for the faint of heart. There are some graphic images in there and there are some graphic studies in there, uh, in including this study here, these images here, which you'll see, which is the effects of gangrene on the arm. In addition to this, with circular number two, circular number five is the circular that actually created the Army Medical Museum. And so, Sanitary, topographical, medical and surgical reports, details of cases, essays, the results of investigations, inquiries, anything that could be considered of value was sent here in Washington, D.C. And a lot of the times they were sent in barrels full of alcohol in order to preserve these specimens that were being sent from the fields. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, eventually all of these studies, all of these circulars would have been published in about 15 different volumes over the course of the next 20 years after the war had ended. And a lot of these studies and a lot of these specimens were housed in the Army Medical Museum, now known as the Muse National Museum of Health and Medicine today, just outside of Washington, D.C. And so, for all of these medical uh, journals and a lot of these cases and a lot of these specimens provided a wealth of knowledge for future generations. And Edward Smith, who was a physician who wrote to Dr. Hammond uh, congratulating him on these circulars, wrote that if there is any benefit from the sad struggle of this age, it is that the medical officers can fully justify looking for information and present the information for the world's future use. And even 150 years later, 
we can still go and visit the National Museum of Health and Medicine today. And again, I would highly suggest if you go and visit, it is an amazing museum to go and see. Uh, however, you do need to have a strong stomach uh, to go and visit it, for you are seeing specimens, including Dan Sickles' leg, uh, several Civil War soldiers there as well. And so within these circulars, there are a few different pieces of Civil War medicine and a few different pieces of medical advancements that a lot of us take for granted today that we would find. And one of them is bacteriology. And so bacteriology is essentially the study of germs and what causes diseases. And over the course of the Civil War, surgeons and all the medical personnel didn't know what caused these diseases and what made people sick. They didn't understand how germs spread, and as a result, they violated almost nearly every rule about the sterilization of the tools and sterilization of um, the body that surgeons use today. One soldier remarked at the beginning of the Civil War that it was common to see a, a doctor with his sleeves rolled up to his elbows, his bare arms, as well as his linen apron smeared with blood, and his knife held between his teeth. In addition to this, doctors were practicing uh, some different antique, or different antique methods that we now know to be completely out of date, one of which was laudable pus. Laudable pus was a sign of an infection that we now know today, but pus, they thought back then, was actually praiseworthy. It meant that a wound was healing. So what they actually did, they used superation cups to actually help keep a wound damp, keep a drip on it, keep that wound moist, and when this pus appeared, they thought it was healing properly, and they would take that pus and transfer it from one soldier to the other to pass on the healing properties. When in fact, we now know today they were passing on infections. In addition to this, they started to experiment with different kinds of sutures, especially with these shortages of supplies. And one of the common sutures used over the course of the Civil War was actually horsehair. And when using this horsehair, horsehair is very coarse and it's tough to work with. And surgeons actually started to boil it, to soften it, make it easier to work with, make it a little bit more pliable. But when they did that, they started to realize that soldiers who were being sutured with the horsehair rather than the silk or the wire thread were not becoming as ill. And the wounds were not becoming as infected. And so this helped lead to the invention of the germ theory and to the idea that boiling things, boiling water, washing your hands, starts to kill germs. And so one surgeon also remarked after the war into the specifics of the type of horsehair that should be used. And he wrote that for the purpose of a suture, a long white tail is actually the best horsehair to use. And he writes, before being used, it should be soaked for a minute or two in boiling water so that it may be, or it may be drawn once or twice through the hands, uh, through your fingers with moistened ends if that hair had dried out. The next thing that we use a lot today that a lot of people take for granted is reconstructive surgery, now known today as more commonly as plastic surgery. Now, over the course of the Civil War, with the vast majority of these operations taking place in the hospitals were amputations, you have several soldiers uh, and uh, several soldiers who are left with deformities, and for those who are not able to have any kind of prosthetic uh, or any kind of um, reconstruction previously were forced to live a doomed life where some soldiers could not be seen in public anymore, they could not uh, function, they could not support their families, and it had a terrible impact on these soldiers' mental states. Well, with the, construction, uh, with the creation of reconstructive surgery, this started to change in about the 1830s. However, it was very simple, of just pulling skin, twisting skin, things of that nature. But over the course of the Civil War, it actually started to grow and increase into a much more uh, prominent practice. And one of the surgeons who was most commonly known for his reconstructive surgery was Dr. Gurdon Buck of New York, who was one of the most active and one of the most successful practitioners of this reconstructive use, uh, surgery using rotary. Uh, rotation, transposition, which is uh, cutting different pieces of skin and replacing it, 
uh, as well as shifting things around in order to try and help the soldiers live the easiest and most um, normal lives that they possibly could. And this here is one of the most common cases that you would find, or one of the most well-known cases that you would find of reconstructive surgery. And this is Private Roland, uh, Roland Ward. And these images that you see here are actually included in the surgical uh, history of the War of the Rebellion for numbers 167, 168, 169, and 170. And the case for this says, a fistulous orifice, one-fourth of an inch in diameter, only remaining in consequence of constant secretion of saliva, he is able to articulate quite plainly, which he has hitherto been unable to do since the date of his injury. Until the completion of his operation, the patient was compelled to assume a recumbent position to receive his nourishment and even a swallow of water. He can now take his food and drink standing up. Uh, he also has the use of a metal a rubber button, excuse me, a rubber button pr properly adjusted in the fistulas uh, so that he can actually have this food and drink and stop the secretion of saliva from making its exit externally. And so you can see that by the use of this button and by the use of this reconstructive surgery, his face almost quite literally is reconstructed to where he can have a normal life, where he can talk, where he can eat, where he can drink, and sitting up and rejoin society. But for a lot of these soldiers, for these reconstructive surgeries, it's not quite so simple when you're losing an arm or when you're losing a leg. And so the vast majority of operations that took place over the Civil War were amputations. In fact, there were over 600, uh, excuse me, over 60,000 amputations over the course of the Civil War. And so prosthetics became an important part of Civil War medicine, not only just for mobility, but for uh, being able to become inconspicuous and rejoin civilian society as well. Now, for soldiers who had amputations, having a prosthetic limb was a lot easier to have if you had a leg amputation. For soldiers who had an arm amputation, a lot of the most common prosthetics that were given these soldiers you would see was the arm, uh, the arm prosthetic in which the hand was solely a hook. And for a lot of these soldiers, having a hook for a hand was incredibly uncomfortable. It was also very, uh, it was not very inconspicuous. And so many of these soldiers actually rather, uh, rather preferred to have the empty sleeve rather than have the arm prosthetic. But for a lot of these prosthetics, you had a lot more common prosthetics uh, being seen from 1861 to 1873 for leg prosthetics. Between 1845 and 1860, uh, 1861, you had 34 patents that were issued for uh, different leg prosthetics. By 1873, you had 133 uh, patents that were issued for prosthetic limbs. And they were uncomfortable uh, to function. They were uncomfortable to walk around in. But for many cases, a lot of these soldiers were able to stand, and they were able to stumble around and rejoin society. And one of the, almost one of the first soldiers to undergo an amputation was this soldier here, whose name was James Hanger from Churchville, Virginia. He lost his leg in June 3rd of 1861. And he found the prosthetic that was given to him incredibly uncomfortable, and so he designed his own, called the Hanger Limb. And the Hanger Limb actually became so popular that by midpoint through the war, he actually started to distribute it among other soldiers who needed it. And by 1871, he had actually created his own company. And so by 1888, he actually had several businesses with several offices from Washington, D.C., St. Louis, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Baltimore, and Atlanta, uh, to which he actually was able to merge it into a larger company called the J.E. Hanger Company. And now the J.E. Hanger Company is one of the leading prosthetic companies in the United States today. And so 
for the prosthetics that soldiers had to use over the course of the Civil War. Like I said, they were uncomfortable, they weren't quite as functional, but they were just functional enough for these soldiers to be able to stand, to be able to stumble, to be able to rejoin society uh, in terms of socialization, uh, maybe even working in some of the shops and working throughout the towns. But by now today, with the prosthetics that we have available, we can have prosthetics that actually have functioning fingers. We have prosthetics that we can actually run with uh, and can actually perform all the regular duties that we would if we had two legs. And for a lot of these soldiers who had had to have reconstructive surgery, like I said, it was just enough for them to be able to function comfortably, but with many of these faces, uh, they would not be the same as they had been before the war. But today, for reconstructive surgery, we take a lot of that for granted, and we can have feet, arms, faces, entire body parts reconstructed uh, for both medical purposes for, uh, purposes for necessity as well as for beauty as well. And so with the Civil War, with over four years of Civil War, you have over 700 thousand casualties that again created this life and death uh, fight that was full of challenges from the weather, uh, from the shortage of personnel and food uh, to being out in the field. But with war and all of the sacrifice and all of this, uh, all of this carnage, all of that had not been in vain, for we were able to use their ultimate sacrifice to be able to learn and to be able to study and grow our medical professionals so that we can take the medicine that they did not have and that we can use it today to live longer, healthier, fuller lives. Thank you so much for having me here for this symposium discussion today. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed my conversation. And if you're interested in learning more information or checking out these medical and surgical histories of the War of the Rebellion, they've all been digitized and they're all online for you to take a look at and peruse through. Uh, and so thank you very much for having me.